ಹಿಂಗೆ ಹೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ಎಲ್ಲ ಜನದ ಇದೇ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ನಾನು ಆಚೆ ಏನು to the sunday breakfast session dealing with echocardiography today we'll be dealing with lung ultrasound which is an important component component of care of patients in intensive care units and uh, to begin with i would like to introduce dr jos chako he is very well known for his uh, echocardiography skills he is working in narayan hudiyala bangalore and we have dr uh who is again a well known uh, intensive care specialist of bangalore and then we have arjun alva who is the group um, uh, administrative head of critical care services narayan hudiyala bangalore before actually i invite uh, josh to start his talk i would like to mention that uh, please keep all your mics muted excepting those of the moderators and the speakers all the other mics and videos must be kept off and at the end of the session uh, there will be questions and answers if you would like you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly or you can pose your question or comment on the chat box with these few introductory words i would like to uh, request dr arjun alwa and dr ajit to carry on with the today's session thank you so much so hi good morning i think we can start the session so i request dr joshua ko sir to uh, start the lectures okay thank you thanks very much i'll just upload my presentation are you able to see my powerpoint yes yes okay so let's start uh we will go through the basics of lung ultrasonography this morning i intend to do this whole session on ultrasonography of the lung in two parts we will do the very basics today and then in a couple of weeks time which is sunday after next i will go through part 2 which will be a little more elaborate so we'll begin with uh, the most simple stupid things and uh, uh, as we go we will progress to the more complex views imaging and so on so just imagine you are in the middle of a basic icu a icu with several sick patients many of them on the verge of crashing and the nurses keep pestering you with something or the other and then you find one of your patients who was on ventilation suddenly out of the blue becomes profoundly hypoxic and you are clueless as to what's going on you try the good old method of listening with a stethoscope you auscultate all those well defined areas that have been traditionally born out through the ages the infraclavicular scapular and so on apart from a few cracks as they call it you come across very little that you had a definitive clue as to what may be going on with your sick patient so so what next you ask for an x ray but the technician is busy they are around in the hospital but it will take time and it is also possible that the x-ray may not tell the whole story there may be more intricate details which you will very often miss out on the chest radiograph and that's when this machine by side will be an eye opener for you it will 
surely offer you more clues and guide you through what may be going on with your patient first and then take appropriate action to best handle the situation. So let's start with the very basics. What are the most important buttons that you need to push on this machine? Every machine will be some modification of what you see on the screen here. There will of course be a switch on machine, switch on button. And then there is a gain button. There is a gain knob in this case, which if you turn, will change the brightness of the whole screen. And then there will be sliders, which will allow you to change the gain or change the brightness sector by sector, starting from top to bottom. As you move it to the right, it will become brighter. And as you move it to the left, it will become less bright. And then of course you have the depth button. If you want to see deeper, superficial, of course it depends on the probe that you use as well. But the depth button is a very important uh, button to push in case you need to see deeper or if you need more uh, detailed views of superficial tissues. So that's about the basic nobology before you embark upon lung ultrasonography. The next question is, what probes would you use to view the lung? It depends on what would you like to see. If you're interested in seeing the pleura, if you're interested in getting high resolution images of the pleura and the immediate subpleural layers, then you would go by the linear probe or the high frequency probe, which offers you very good views of the superficial structures. This particular probe is a mid frequency probe. It is eight megahertz, doesn't come with all the machines, but if you specifically ask most of the brands to offer you this particular probe, the advantage of this probe is first of all, it is mid frequency. So you can see superficial and deep in most patients, except in those who are very obese, in which case you may have trouble viewing the deeper structures. And also because of its very small teeny weeny footprint, you can squig squiggle it through an intercostal space without the ribs coming in the way. So that's the advantage of using this probe. And I would strongly recommend that if you have this probe, you get on with it in most patients. And then of course you have the conventional curvy linear probe, which is primarily meant to view the deeper parts of the lung, but you can get reasonable views of the pleura, the pleural sliding. And in, in patients who are obese, of course, this probe will help you see better than, than the linear, of course, and the microconvex probes. So with a linear probe, as you can see here, you can see the pleura, that's the rib shadow. Don't misunderstand this for the pleural line. It's not the pleural line, it's the very chondrium of the rib, and you can see the shadow cast by the rib, the hypoechoic shadow there. And on either side, you see the pleura sliding. This is a same image or similar image viewed using a microconvex probe placed just below the clavicle. And as you can see, you can see the pleura well, and you can see deeper structures as well, which you're not able to see with a linear probe. And then of course, the curvy linear, five megahertz. The pleura is not so clear. You can obviously see it most from side to side, but you can see much deeper with it compared to these two probes. So at the end of the day, it depends on how deep would you like to see or how superficial would you like to see? Would you like to look at the pleura or deeper down? And the next important question will be, just like when you auscultate the lung, you have been traditionally taught to go systematically through individual auscultatory areas of the chest, you must systematically cover 
all the regions of the lungs as well. And to enable you to do this, for convenience, you divide the chest wall into several zones. It's pretty simple. There is no rocket science behind it. You draw two vertical lines, one through the anterior axillary line and another one through the posterior axillary line. So you have two vertical lines, okay? And then right across these two lines, you cut them across with a horizontal line. Now, what do you see? You, you have six zones per each hemithorax. So that is anterior, anterior superior, anterior inferior, lateral superior, lateral inferior, and the posterior superior and the posterior inferior zones. Most importantly, do not forget to view these areas of the chest, areas five and six, which are of crucial importance. I cannot overemphasize the importance of looking at these areas because that's where it all happens in patients who are sick, in the ICU, on a ventilator. The earliest changes, be it collapse, be it consolidation, be it pulmonary edema, purely because of gravitational reasons, purely because of Newton's law of gravity, it tends to happen in the dependent areas of the chest. And as you know, ARDS is a dependent lung disease purely because of gravitational effect. So the bottom line, do not forget, even if you don't look at these, do look at the posterior zones of the lung. They are of crucial importance and the key to the diagnosis may lie well within these areas. Now, what do you look for? What are the basic findings that you see? What you see here, I'm doing an imaging of my own chest using a eight megahertz microconvex probe. You see the pleural line and there is nothing below. There are no B lines. But if you look at this particular image, it looks drastically different from what you see here. You can see the pleural line. You can see it move from side to side. And then in contrast to this particular image, you see several lines that originate from the pleural line, move with the pleural line from side to side, and go down to the bottom of the image. These, as most of you already know, are the so-called B lines. And they just indicate that there is interstitial lung fluid or maybe intraalveolar fluid at that particular spot. So it just means that there is fluid in the interstitial compartment of the lung in this particular area. Now, if you look at these B lines, you can see them individually. You can count them. Say there are maybe three or four per view. So they are discrete, easily identifiable as individual lines. Just compare that with this particular image. You can see the plural line and below it, it seems like it is all white. There is a white patch, almost like a uniform white patch. It is, is it a good sign or bad sign? It is not a good sign at all. It is, a, it is much worse compared to what you see here. These are actually B lines that are merged together so much so that you cannot identify them individually. They are the so-called coalescent B lines. So you progress from zero, which is no B lines, or maybe maximum two to three B lines, to plenty of B lines, but they can be discreetly identified. You can see them, you can count them individually to this particular feature, wherein you cannot tell them individually. It's just coalesced together. And then 
this is the worst possible this is the first possible image that you can get in a damaged lung if you can see here the probe is actually placed just below the costal margin on the right side and you see what looks like the liver in terms of the echo texture it looks very much like the liver but you don't see white streaks traversing through the liver in this case you can see there are white streaks that are moving up and down moving from side to side all over the place within what looks like the liver so that is just a hepatized lung it's a consolidated lung with very little aeration the only aeration that you see is within the bronchi and those are these white streaks that you see moving back and forth through the bronchi they are air bronchograms or ultrasonographic air bronchograms within a hepatized lung or what's described as a tissue like lung the lung looks like soft tissue so you attribute you can ascribe scores to the lung depending on what you see this is zero that is my own lung which is zero there and here you see one which is discrete b lines coalescent b lines carry two points and if you see any type of consolidation that will be through three points so how do you score you ascribe the number of points to each of these zones from 0 to 3 so there will be six zones on each hemithorax so what's the maximum score you can get six zones per, per hemithorax so that will be 12 zones overall and the maximum score of 3 per zone so 12 times 3 will give you a maximum score of 36 points which is the worst possible situation that you can be in your patient does ultrasonography help with identifying tube position after intubation we all have intubated the esophagus accidentally and perhaps even catastrophically at times and if you have the machine switched on by the bedside ultrasonography is a useful tool it will tell you for sure if you have intubated the esophagus by mistake on this image with the linear probe placed across the neck you can see the trachea very clearly so that's the tracheal ring and to the left of the trachea you see another hole this is the esophagus situated to the left of the trachea if you intubate the esophagus as you see here you will clearly see the tube going down the wrong hole and finally when you finish you will see what's described as a double trachea sign you will see the normal trachea here and just to the next of the trachea on the left side you will see what's what looks like a mirror image of this trachea because the tube lies within the esophagus so that is a tell tale sign is of esophageal intubation and you better pull out the tube ventilate your patient and try again and then of course i suggest that you keep the ultrasound machine booted up and ready especially if you have a hunch that your intubation is going to be difficult then of course you look at the lung ultrasonography is much more sensitive in terms of ventilation as you can see here if you see this after intubation pleura sliding nicely from side to side you are confident that you are in the right place and if you see something like this this is a video image you can see the rib you can see the pleura lying under the rib do you see any sliding there no there is no sliding so that is suspicious of course it may be due to other events other than esophageal intubation it may be because the tube is too far down on one side or perhaps the lung is collapsed at that particular point but absence of sliding is a very cardinal sign 
And there is obviously something wrong there if you don't see sliding at any point in the lung. So that's the normal image that you see with the probe placed just below the clavicle, probe marker pointing to the head of the patient or to the right of the patient, which is a standard probe position. And what you see there, you see the pleural line very clearly. You see the pleural line, that's the pleural line. And then just below the pleural line, you see another couple of lines. That's the pleural line. It's another line there, another line there. What are these lines? These lines are just purely artifactual. There is nothing there. There is no structure that represents these lines. These are just reverberation artifacts of the pleural line. It is purely because ultrasound beams come in pulses. They strike the pleura first, and then the next, the next lot of ultrasound beams come and strike the pleura again, which is which is understood by the machine as something lower down, and it keeps on happening lower and lower. And if you look at the distance, the distance between the surface and the pleural line, distance between the pleural and the A-line will all be the same. They should be the same. So those are A lines. A lines are normal. They are just artifactual. And if you have B lines, they tend to erase these A lines. So you have the normal lung there, discrete B lines, which is a score of one. And then from discrete to coalescent B lines, score from one to two. And then you see this, that's consolidation. What do you see here? Is there any difference between this particular image and this image? There is a very subtle difference if you watch closely. In this particular instance, you can see the tissue-like lung, the hepatized lung. You can see air bronchograms. And what's happening to these air bronchograms? You can see them move up and down. So they are dynamic air bronchograms. In contrast, look at this particular video clip. You see plenty of lines, plenty of uh, air bronchograms, but they don't appear to move like these air bronchograms do. There is, of course, a tissue like lung all around. So you call these air bronchograms because they are moving, you call them dynamic air bronchograms. And because they are static here, they're not moving. You call them static air bronchograms. And what does that signify? Dynamic air bronchograms suggest that there is consolidation, while static air bronchograms suggest that there is collapse. Just easy to remember, it's like this. If the bronchus is obstructed distally, obviously, there won't be any movement of, the of air in the bronchi because there is obstruction. So the air within the bronchi are trapped, is trapped within the bronchi and they don't move, giving rise to the so-called static air bronchograms in collapse. But in consolidation, assuming that there is no obstruction, air will keep moving back and forth through the bronchi. So static air bronchograms collapse lung, dynamic air bronchograms consolidation. So that's dynamic, that is static. This patient came to us several months ago and he was very hypoxic after intubation. You can see the tube sitting there, tubes in the right place. But as you can see, there was a complete white out of the lung. In fact, we did the ultrasonography well before we got this X-ray and that's what we saw, which, is, which you saw previously as well. The lung was not at all expanding. You can see static air bronchograms. And in fact, we did a bronchoscopy and post bronchoscopy, the lung did expand step by step. And finally, it really expanded and the oxygenation improved as well. Okay, so that is dynamic air bronchograms, coalescent B lines. 
And in this particular case, that is the, that's the chest X-ray of this patient. You can see that you don't, you see a few infiltrates on the right side, but nothing very much really. You would expect those changes in a critically ill patient, but ultrasound, just see what that shows. There are plenty of coalescent B lines and you see subplural consolidation, which again is an important sign on ultrasound. When you see, when you see subplural consolidations, with a linear probe, there is obviously a serious problem there. And this finding, of course, was confirmed on the CT scan, extensive consolidation both sides, and it happened to be one of those viral pneumonias. We were talking about the plural slide and the significance of the lack of the plural slide. This is a very sinister sign. If you don't see the plural sliding, there is something seriously wrong there. There are several reasons as to why the pleura may not slide. First of all, the tube may be down the wrong bronchus, maybe right endobronchial intubation. The left, lung, the left lung won't expand and you'll see the pleura is not sliding there. If the lung is collapsed down, again, you won't see the pleura slide. If there is Consolidation, dense consolidation, the pleura will not slide. Or if there is a pleural problem, again, it will not slide. And most importantly, pneumothorax, which can present very dramatically in the ICU, particularly when you're using high ventilation pressures, high PEEP levels in your patient. Out of the blue, your patient may become severely hypoxic and bedside ultrasonography will tell you if there is a pneumothorax or not. So absence of slide suggests pneumothorax, but is it specific? No, it is not specific. As I mentioned, there are several other reasons as to why the pleura may not slide, pneumothorax being one of them. But in a suspicious clinical situation, like as I mentioned, patient being ventilated with high PEEP, high inspiratory pressures, or you did a central line and suddenly the patient becomes hypoxic. And if you see lack of slide, strong suggestion that there may be a pneumothorax lying underneath. So that's a non-specific sign of pneumothorax, which is the absence of pleural slide. Is there a specific sign that you can say with 100% certainty that there is indeed a pneumothorax? Yes. The answer is you can tell with 100% certainty. If you see this particular feature, here you can see the pleura slide on one half of the image, which is the green line. But where the red line goes, you see the pleura does not slide. So one segment of the pleura seems to slide from side to side. The other segment does not do. And there is a junction between the pleura that slides and the pleura that does not slide, which you call the lung point. If you see a lung point, if you see a lung point, there is only one diagnosis, and that is pneumothorax, pneumothorax, pneumothorax. There's nothing else and you better act if your patient is unstable. And of course, you can check with the M mode. If you see a lung point, M mode is not particularly necessary. This is the normal M mode view, wherein you see a, what's described as a barcode or a stratosphere sign until the pleura and below the pleura, you see a sand-like or a sandy seashore-like pattern. That's normal. But if you have an hemothorax, you will see the barcode or the stratosphere sign extend from top to bottom without this seashore sign occupying one half of the image. So if you see this on the M mode, that again suggests pneumothorax. But you don't really need to do this just by 
looking at the B mode, plural slide, lung point is enough to tell you the whole story. So I think I will finish off for now. We will carry on with part two in a couple of weeks time. Before I go, let me introduce you to our book on the controversies in critical care, which is being released in a week from now as a Kindle edition to begin with. The print edition will come later. So if you look at our specialty of critical care medicine, it's been riddled with controversies right from the time beyond Ibsen started his ICU at Copenhagen in 1953. He started doing tracheostomies on patients with polymyelitis and people ask the question, why the hell do you do this? It is relevant to remember that even today, we are confused as to what is an optimal time to do a tracheostomy or be it setting PEEP levels in your patient with ARDS assessing volume responsiveness. What is the optimal vasopressor? Does dopamine indeed have the magical qualities that it is purported to have? All these questions continue to stagger us in our clinical practice. And this book deals with 50 plus such controversies which has riddled our specialty over the last more than 50 years of its existence. So we offer you the most updated evidence on these topics with authors, including Ian Sipelt, who is the lead investigator of ANSIX at the moment. In fact, you may have read the article on selective digestive decontamination published in NEJM just recently. Ian Sipelt was the lead author. And then of course, I have my own colleague, Sapnil Pawar from St. Vincent's, and then Gagan Brar, who's a critical care specialist at Astor Hospital. So there is a, huge volume of information coming up in this book and be free to look out for it. I'll keep you updated. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, we can take them now. So, so thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Joe Sacco, sir. Hearty congratulations for, and thanks for bringing out the book Controversy in Critical Care. And thanks for the excellent presentation. So this, uh, this is open for discussion. Any queries are there? We can, from the students, audience, anything you said, we can respond to that. Sir, I have one small query with you. Uh, yes. So for the student's sake, so what I, obviously we all understand that the, the higher the frequency, the more superficial you see, obviously. And obviously if you want to see a deeper structures, you need to have a lower frequency. So, yes. uh, so that's, so basically what you have mentioned is that 12 Hertz, the, the, you know, the probe for, you know, for the esophageal intimation. So I just recently came to know that now there is something which I never used. This 14 hertz probe, special probe is available, which is the hyper superficial probe, which, which maybe the, the intubation, maybe the esophageal structure will be much, much easier to visualize. So do you have any experience or? Um, 14 megahertz I haven't used. 14 but years. In our machine, uh, in our machine, there is the option to increase the frequency a little bit, uh, although the the median frequency is 12. You can increase or decrease it a little bit. I'm not sure if it goes up to 14. Um, but uh, the question is, what do you use 14 megahertz for in the sense, uh, if it's uh, vascular cannulation, uh, 12 megahertz or even lower should be more than adequate. And if you can, if you can, if you look at the plura, you get pretty good images with the 12 megahertz probe as well. So I'm not entirely sure how it, how it helps really. Yes, yes, yes. So one question from the, one of the students, how to measure plural effusion? Uh, we will deal with plural effusion in the next uh, session. Uh, I was going to do it uh, in detail on how to measure it, how to locate it, and so on. So we can do that at the next session. There is a definite formula to calculate the approximate volume of a plural effusion. Although if you're experienced, you can just eyeball and tell him, which may be more than enough. The calculation is not precise anyway, so eyeballing will do, but there is a, a formula that you can use to calculate, which we will discuss in the next session. And another query is how to identify atelectasis. Maybe we can discuss in the next lecture, if you want to say something, uh, how to identify atelectasis. I I can show you the same image that I showed you before. 
I hope this is uh, visible to all. Yeah, yeah. Visible? yeah. So in a collapsed lung, that, that's the lung. It looks like hepatized. It looks like the liver. It looks like what's called tissue sign. There is no air movement there. But you, you see plenty of white streaks. These are air bronchograms. However, these air bronchograms, they are static, unlike the air bronchograms on this particular image, wherein you can see them move up and down. In this case, you cannot move them, see them move up and down. They're just static against the background of tissue-like lung. So if you see this, tissue-like lung, static air bronchograms, that means collapse. If you see this tissue-like lung with mobile or dynamic air bronchograms, that is consolidation. So that is a simple method to assess. Usually it is possible to tell clearly if it is collapse or if it's consolidation. I hope that answers the question. Yes. So, so Dr. Murli sir, are you around sir? Yes, yes, I am very much so, here. I just so, want to make one comment and one uh, sort of a question. And the comment is that the frequency, uh, higher the frequency, um, uh, better is the resolution, but poor is the penetration. Though, so the frequency has a role of, uh, um, I mean, the there's a trade-off between pen penetration and resolution. So lower frequencies can penetrate deeper but the resolution is somewhat poorer. So that is the usual thing uh, which is seen. And the question is, uh, do you think, uh, Dr. Jos, do you think uh, with good echo, uh, lung ultrasound, can, we can do away with uh, X-rays? Do you think so? Is it going to happen? It depends on the skill of the performer. Yes. Totally dependent on the skill. With time, I feel, you get more, much, much more information with bedside ultrasound than with X-rays. Right. X-rays will just show you shades of black, white, and gray. You don't really know what's going on there, most of the time, that is. Or you have to assume. You have to say, okay, I see this line extending up to the axilla from the diaphragm, so that may be pleural effusion. It may be collapse. Not entirely sure. But with the ultrasound probe, most of the time, you can tell very clearly what is the underlying pathology? Is it consolidation? Is it effusion? Right. Is it collapse? Is it pulmonary edema? Is it ARDS? You can get straight answers to that question most of the time, which you cannot get on a bedside x-ray. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Dr. Arjun is around, Dr. Arjun Alva. Uh, hi, Ajit. Uh, anything? Uh, uh, no, I think uh, Joss is, uh, um, we are all waiting for the uh, next class, I'm sure all of them, um, which will answer most of the measurements of uh, 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 of the lung ultrasound in, in the uh, lung ultrasound as well. Yeah. Um, so, so there was another question from somebody saying, what, what happens in one lung ventilation? Um, uh, is there any role of ultrasound in one lung ventilation to uh, to diagnose collapse and does the lung pulse sign help there? That's a very interesting question. During my days of one lung ventilation, unfortunately, we had no access to anything like, anything near as sophisticated as ultrasound. We just used to go by purely the stethoscope. Uh, but I think I strongly feel that if you have ultrasound, it might help you position the endobronchial tube if you are not using bronchoscopy. And of course, to assess the expansion throughout the procedure as well, uh, particularly with one lung down. And of course, you can look at the expansion post-procedure as well to see if the lung is completely expanded or not. So it should be a useful tool, I feel, by the, by the bedside, although I have no experience at all with it in that situation. So can you, another question is, can you identify pulmonary embolism? Very good question. Very good question. There are several ways in which you can look specifically for pulmonary embolism or using ultrasonography and echocardiography. This of course matters in patients who are too unstable to be moved down for a CT, or perhaps there is some other contraindication to the use of IV contrast to do a uh, CT uh, pulmonary angiogram. So in that situation, you go by several features. First, 
a patient who has a background that suggests a high possibility of DVT, like a young person who had a fracture, immobilized leg for an extended period of time, comes with hypoxia, very strong possibility, one. Second, you look at the lung in a hypoxic patient, you look at the lung in a hypoxic patient, and you... If you see right heart altation in a person who has no business to have right, right heart altation, of course, in COPDs and all that, you will get right heart altation anyway. You cannot go by that. But if in an otherwise healthy person, hypoxia, right heart altation, strong possibility of pulmonary embolism, and very occasionally, not common, you will be able to see the clot sitting in the main pulmonary artery. I have a image of this uh, particular uh, event a uh, long time ago. It is not common. I will try to show it during the next session. So very occasionally, you will see a clot sitting in the pulmonary artery. But generally speaking, the background of immobility, hypoxia with normal looking lungs, right heart dilatation, and very rarely you see a clot. So this is particularly relevant, as I mentioned, if you cannot transfer the patient or if there is some contraindication to uh, contrast. With that, can we wind up the session, sir? Yes. Yeah, if there are no questions. Uh, the other question I want to ask is, do you think this handheld echocardiography will replace the stethoscopes? I so prob probably no, sir. I didn't say because I don't. I, I don't think ultrasound can uh, they are a detector of bronchospasm. <laughs> yeah, for bronchospasm, you need the good old stethoscope. Right, right. In fact, that is one of the few indications to use a stethoscope in the ICU setting. I feel. I agree. I agree. Hmm. Yeah. Another thing is, you know, if it's a general sort of dispensary ultrasound, obviously, I am. I am a reasonably interested guy because I am not an ultrasound freak. I should admit that. But you know, but another thing is that whenever we use ultrasound, the, the major concern what they have been observing is infection. If you don't practice or practice the infection control program, I mean the you know the protocols very strictly, the chance of in you know, a cross infection appears to be I can't prove anything, but it appears to be high. I think we need to be very uh, extremely careful about that because I will say that you know injurious use of you know like I believe that you should do the ultrasound for a focused evaluation. That's my personal perception. And obviously, ultrasound is getting, you know, again and again, it is more, more getting more and more advanced. We have, you know, the, you know, all the probes are there where you do not, have, you do not have to test the patient. So probably that kind of innovations may help in infection control as well without touching the patients. You yeah. can just keep it out of the patient and, you know. Yes, what you say is right, of course, infection control, most important. And I think uh, one of the things that I would like to underline is to keep the probes clean all the time use liberal use of uh, wipes, alcohol wipes, and keep the probes clean. There is some concern that the probe may get damaged with alcohol use, but the, you know, the alcohol content of the wipes that we use is so, so, so low that it doesn't really matter. We've been using it for ages and it doesn't seem to affect the probes at all. So keep the probes clean. Don't leave it to anybody else. You are responsible to clean the probe before you use it and after you use it. Keep it clean for the next operator. There is one question from Aparna. Compared to CT, how deep uh, one could visualize the lungs by ultrasound? That's what I think. Yeah, the depth of visualization is one of the limitations of ultrasound. Like if you place your probe anteriorly, yeah. just below the clavicle, you won't see anything that lies posteriorly. So you need to turn your patient around and see posteriorly. And in many sick patients, they are on their backs, not easy to turn them around to see the posterior dependent areas clearly. And then the scapula comes in the way uh, behind. So that also is a limitation. So deep seated lesions, isolated lesions, like a, a cancer, uh, very localized, you won't see on ultrasound, but that's not what you use ultrasound for anyway in the ICU. Yeah. Where should be the probe pointer is one question which is posed by Dr. Deepak. I, 
I mentioned that, but uh, the convention, I find many uh, amateur ultrasonography users confused mm -hmm. with this. Standard views are with the probe marker pointing to the head or the probe marker pointing to the right. Of course, you can change the probe position depending on what you see, but standard viewing for all modalities of ultrasonography, be it lung, be it abdomen, be it anywhere else, is probe marker to the head or to the right. Thank you for the clarification. So thank you, thank you all for the excellent presentation, especially Dr. Joseph. Thanks all the attendees for, you know, for attending this uh, meeting. So can we- Yeah, yes, next question is on 16th, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So next. the next uh, continuation of this talk will be on the 16th of April. Please join us for the continuation. But in between this Saturday, Sunday, which comes, I think that is the 9th, we'll be having echocardiography session that time. 16th, we'll have the lung ultrasound continuation. Thank you for joining us and uh, have a great Sunday. And we'll see you next, next Sunday, that is on the 9th of April. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank thanks, Marli. Thanks, Ajay. Thank you, thanks, sir. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for thank everyone you. who attended thank this you. session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Sir.